Yeah, yeah. All right, so technical difficulties has led to us starting first, so. The first song we're gonna be singing is Open. Open the eyes to my heart, Lord. this everlasting Father that we have and who is worthy to be praised.
Happy Sabbath to Life Community. Um, so great to be here with you guys today. Um, it's a blessing. Uh, today I have the opportunity to speak over the offerings, and uh, we're going to open our Bibles or our phones to Hebrews 13, 6, and it says, So we can be confident, we can confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can men do to me? You know, when I think about this verse, uh, when it says men, I think about society, I think about peer pressure, I think about politically, social media, you know, and everything that, you know, that, that wants to tear us up, you know, but if we have God in our hearts, what, what can be against us? You know, we, we come in and we put the armor of God in us and uh, we can walk faithfully, you know. Lo que pueda, si quisieran arrodillarse para la ofrenda, vamos a tener una oración. Amado y bondadoso Señor, gracias Padre por por una vez más permitirnos entrar aquí a tu santo templo Señor y poder adorarte Señor te pedimos oh, Señor que, que seas tú siempre con nosotros oh, Señor te pedimos de manera muy especial por las ofrendas oh, Padre eh, gracias Señor por todas las provisiones que tú nos das durante la semana oh, Señor porque sabemos y podemos vivir confiados oh, Señor de que tú suples todas nuestras necesidades Padre Señor no porque tú lo necesites oh, Señor sino que como símbolo lo humilde, Señor, te entregamos lo que a ti te pertenece, oh, Señor, que sea de tu agrado, Señor, y siempre que estés con nosotros, oh, Señor, que el mensaje de esta mañana, oh, Señor, venga desde lo más alto, Señor, bendice al pastor, oh, Señor, y que podamos refrescar nuestras almas con el mensaje que tenemos para hoy, oh, Señor. Todos estos favores te los pedimos en el nombre de Jesús. Amén. How many of you believe that we have an awesome God? If that is so, then I invite you to keep worshiping us and praise His holy name. He is worthy of all the honor, all the glory.
helpers here, Lucia and Emma. They're just gonna be here for um, emotional support. So, <laughs> um, this week we went to the fair. It was great, it was fun. I had forgotten how much fun it is, especially when you see it through the eyes of your children. I'm not talking about the crazy rides. I'm talking about uh, just seeing their joy in the simple things, the, the food, the simple rides, you know, the ones that stay on the ground, you know, those. <laughs> so I saw so many different families, a lot of families, uh, all blended, all kinds of families. But the one thing I saw that was, it made an impact on me is that everybody was there for the same thing, for the joy of seeing their kids having fun. All this, you know, you saw their fa the parents' faces cracking up in laughter when their kids were freaking out, but at the same time enjoying themselves. And that says a lot because we all want that same thing for our own children. If we want that for our children, imagine how much God wants that for us. We are his children. He doesn't want to see us suffering. He doesn't want to see us in pain. He doesn't want to see us struggle. And it came to mind this morning on the car ride over here. I remembered the good gifts verse. In Matthew 7 verse 11, it says, So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father get, give good good gifts to those who ask him palabra de dios there is nothing bigger or better than having that promise okay that this may not be our home but the kingdom of god has that for us and i thank god every day for that uh, let us bow our heads and pray dear heavenly father thank you so much because those good gifts we don't have to wait to receive them we have them thanks to to you lord when we give our lives to you when we put everything in your hands god how much more love can we ever receive you're the one that can give it to us thank you for the sabbath thank you for our lives and be with those who who need this lord and let us be the ones to show them that love show them the love that only and the peace that only you can give god thank you for everything be with us in our service be with the speakers be with the special guest in jesus name i pray amen thank you for that beautiful prayer hello happy sabbath it's great to be together reunited to uh praise and lift the name of Jesus high. Amen? So uh, thank you for being here on this beautiful Saturday. Uh, welcome everyone, those that you uh, came in after the uh, initial welcoming. So we are so, so grateful that you are here. And we know that God is going to bless us. Amen? So this is a moment, uh, this is our uh, family moment, family spotlight moment. And you know that we have a family that we pray for them every Saturday, okay? And it's so great, bless and joy for us to have these families because they are families for, from us, from our community, you know? We are uh, the result of families. And today we have a great family, special family. And last Saturday, I remember we did like, like, a, like a trivia, trying to guess the family, okay? So let's do the same today. Let's see if we can guess the family, okay? So there is a family uh, that they are ready. They, they are going to come here. We are going to pray to, uh, to the Lord to bless their family. But do you have any idea, any guess about who, who can be that family today? No, 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 no. Uriarte. Uriarte. Oh, you forgot. Okay, you forgot. Okay. Okay, I saw another hand. Uh, Ed, Ed, Ed. The Puentes family, the Puentes family, and you're right. We want to come, uh, the Puentes family is here. Come, come up here with us. 
Uh, let's give a hand to them. Yes. Come here, come here. And this is a beautiful family from our community. Great family. They are, I mean, they, they've been here um, uh, for a long time, right? And I saw a picture like maybe a couple months ago when I saw you as a family when these two little, uh, they were really little, you know, and wow, they, they, they have grown, you, you have grown a lot. So, so it's great to, to have you here. It's great to have you with us. You have a great, a great value in our community, in our family, every one of you, every one of you. And we want to thank you because you, um, you make this place a better place for the people here because you are a great family. Amen. Do you agree with me? Yes. Amen. Amen. And I want to tell you something. This family is one of those family that they are always here. And they are always here in everything, okay? In everything. We have them here Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday uh, evening, in Pathfinders, in the activity. So it's great. Uh, I don't know how you, how, how you can do it, but you do it. Uh, and I know because God is a great and a high priority in your life. Yeah, and, and we see the result of that. We see the result of that. So uh, Sujic is not here today. But I have uh, a representative from Suji's company, LLC, <laughs> which is Jessica. And Jessica, she has uh, a present for you. But also, there is a Bible verse that I want to read to you. Because Suji, she told me, please, read it to them. Okay? And I have to, to uh, obey the order. Okay? So, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, and verse 7 through 9. And it's a very known passage from families, from the Bible. It says, the Lord is talking about the responsibility of parents for our children. And he says, impress them on your children. And it's, it's, he means uh, the word of God, you know. Impress them on your children. When, when it says them, it means the law of God. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up, tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And it's a message rem reminding us to have all the time the teachings from God with us which is the, everything that we have here in the Bible, okay? And that is the message for you. Keep the word of God with you everywhere, every place where you are, okay? So we have a present here, but before, before, before Jessica, yes, we are going to have the prayer. I want to invite the elders. Um, we have Mario, we have Joab uh, here with us today, and we want to invite them to come here to have this very special moment of prayer. And because we have Dr. Uriarte with us today, uh, it was expensive. Uh, yeah, it cost a lot of money, but we finally got him. <laughs> the best things in life usually cost money. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. That's right. So we want to invite uh, Dr. Uriarte to have a special prayer today. So we, with the elders, we are going to extend our hands uh, above them, upon them, and then Dr. Uriarte is going to ask the blessing from heaven to this beautiful, beautiful family. You can just be with us as we pray. Let's pray. All right. Even before I start praying, you can raise your heads for a moment. I'm so happy to be here with you guys, because you really are a special family. I remember your parents. I can't even talk about this, because I always get emotional. But I remember your parents very much. Um, and I know your parents, too. But you guys are unreal, all right? And you know who says that? It's not me who says that. And it's not Jesus, but, uh, but, it, but it's somebody whose opinion I value so much, and that's my wife. My wife's opinion is so much more important than my opinion. That's, that's just how life is. You'll understand that later on. <laughs> down in life. But she thinks the world of both of you. I think highly of you too. So I'm really happy to be here with you and, and have this moment to have a word of prayer with you. And since the language of heaven is Spanish, we'll have it in Spanish. Padre eterno, 
Te agradezco tanto, Señor, el que me hayas llamado para tener una oración con la familia Puentes. Gracias, Padre, por haberlos traído a esta iglesia. Gracias, Señor, por el trabajo que ellos hacen. Gracias por sus hijos. Gracias por el esfuerzo que, que ellos ponen en todas las cosas que hay aquí en esta iglesia, porque ellos son parte de los que dan y no están nada más que para recibir. Y tú necesitas siervos que quieran dar más que recibir. Te ruego, Padre Santo, que seas con Dani y con Sandy, que los bendigas, que los guíes, que les ayudes, que les prepares para los eventos que están por suceder y que ellos puedan guiar a, a sus hijos por el buen camino. Amén. Que dentro sí. de muy pronto ellos puedan ser elevados en las nubes de los cielos para darle la bienvenida a nuestro Salvador y que allí estén Joel y Ann, que estén allí también con una gran sonrisa diciendo, mis padres me hablaron de ti y por fin te conozco. Llévame a morar contigo, Señor. Gracias, Padre. Bendícenos a todos y que tu presencia esté en nuestros corazones hoy y siempre. Amén. En el nombre de Cristo oramos. Amén. Amén. God bless you. Guys. Thank you. Thank you. And now, yes, we have the, this present. It's something, uh, it's not something really big, but there is a lot of meaning on that gift for you. That you know what is? It's based in the text that we read in the Bible. There are just as, uh, some short verses from the, from the Bible that you can put in different places in your house. You know, that's uh, the fulfillment of what God says. Put my words everywhere where you are in your life. Okay? So God bless you so much. God bless you. May God bless you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, okay. Uh, we now, we are ready for the message for today. But before, yes, but before to open the Word of God, we have something special, okay? Something is really, really special. We have uh, a young lady from our family, from our community, and she's going to sin. We just uh, realized, or we just found out that she uh, has a passion to sin, just a couple weeks ago. And today we want to welcome Adria, Ad, Adriela, right? Adriela, 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 ven acá, come here. Adriela, she is not alone. She's going to sing, but she is going to have uh, a musician playing the guitar with her. And it's uh, somebody you, that you really know very well, is Pedro Morel. Let's give a hand to Pedro Morel. Yes. Pedro, it's great to have you here in a live community again because I know that you have been here in the past. Okay, say it again. I miss being here with them for a long time, but I'm here today. I'm happy to be here. Amen. And we are happy to have you also, okay? Adriela, welcome. And we hope that God can bless us through the message that you are going to bring with that son. Thank you, Pastor. Happy Sabbath, everyone. <laughs> And this praise is to thank God for everything he has done and keep doing in my life.
Señor, tus milagros no puedo negar y tengo que contarlos y testificar que tú nunca defraudas ni puedes caer. He visto tenderse tus brazos para poderme sostener. Tú nunca me dejas ni puedes cambiar. He visto tu amor ser más fuerte que aún de tu fidelidad sé que aún me quedan pruebas que enfrentar mas tú nunca defraudas Thank God for everything. Thank you. And I hope you can hear me because now I can hear myself. That's good. All right. And you know what? The, the, the lights up here make the people that are here not be able to see you. So, yeah, I can see Julia. She's sitting so close. I can see you guys, but probably from about the fifth bench out, that's it. I'm out. So uh, please don't fall asleep on me. I'll do my best. Uh, where, uh, way way um, to, to warn you before I start, I have just gotten over a cold but I have a frog stuck in my throat. So if you see me do, that's it, it's the frog, it's not me. All right, guys. Two, two. Matthew 24, verses 37 to 41. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be with the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other one left. Two. Two. Two persons. One taken. One left behind. Two houses. One built on the rock. One built on sand. Two gates. One narrow, one really wide. Two sons, the one who left and the one who stayed. Two plants, the wheat and the tares. 
and two endings, salvation and perdition. Two. Two. So today I want to share with you some uh, aspects of the life of two men that you know, you, you know there is, there's no mystery with these two men, but I want to I wanna go into some, some areas of, of their lives and see whether that helps us figure out where we are in our own lives. Two, two men that were apart, apparently running parallel lives, yet when the end came, they ended up on opposite sides of the spectrum, as far away from each other as they could possibly be. Two lives that can show us where we are. I know the Bible, Jesus is the central figure of the Bible, but, but there are some places where the focus is even bigger on him. And, and that can be said of chapters 26 and 27 of the book of Matthew. Uh, but in, in, that, in, those, in those chapters, there are two persons who we may lose sight of who they are and what they play in, in that scenario of that end of Jesus' life. And I, I'd like to, to go over some, some of who they were and what they were going through at that time. See, both had the greatest privilege ever given to mankind. Never before and never after has anyone received the privilege that these two men got. Both felt so attracted to Jesus that they left everything behind to follow him. And I don't know if we ever would do that. If, if Jesus ever said and came by and said, leave everything you're doing and follow me, I wonder, I wonder, it's just a question out there, whether we would be willing to do something like that, whether we would be willing to, to say, I'm not going to work on Monday, whether we would be willing to say, they can evict me, evict me from my apartment or they can foreclose my house because I'm not going to have any earnings, any, any income to be able to pay the mortgage. As a matter of fact, I'm not even going to be living there anymore. My car, it's going to get repoed. I mean, so many things that would go through our minds. I don't know what our answers would be, but these two men said, I'm going. I'm going, and they went. And they followed Jesus very closely for around three years. Three years of following him. Both of these men made public declarations of their devotion to Jesus. Public declarations. It's not, not just that they felt that in their heart. It's that they came out in the open and they say, yes, this is him. This is him. I'm, I'm following him. Both had been trained by Jesus himself to be essentially what today we would call pastors and, and, and even more than that, and even more than that, but trained not by teachers at Andrews University or at Walla Walla. Not, not, not by that. No, no. Taught by Jesus himself. That's the one that gave them their training. And they were not just students. They were disciples. And being a student and being a disciple are two different things. A student is just trying to get knowledge and he may or may not agree, you know, well, okay, I go, I need to take a test, I need to pass it, I move on. A disciple doesn't think that way. A disciple is thinking, I need to do everything that my master tells me and I want to live the life that he tells me to live. I want to emulate him. I want to be him. That's not a student, that's a disciple. That's where these two men were. They were taught things that were unknown to others. Jesus would tell them things that other people didn't know anything about, but he would tell them. These two men saw Jesus on a number of occasions do miracles. Man, I wonder... How, how would that feel 
to see an actual miracle. Have you ever felt like you want to see a miracle? You want to see, you know, but something like, like somebody, yeah, yeah, you can raise your hand. I'm raising my hand too. Yeah, yeah, I want to see a miracle, man. I, I really do. I mean, I would love to be there when somebody that is touched by the Lord tells somebody in a wheelchair, get up and walk. And the person gets up and walk. And said, wow, man, and somebody that is blind, and he says, open your eyes and see. And he takes a look around and says, I see everything. Man, miracles. To, to see someone in a casket, and, and, and someone gets to it and says, in the name of Jesus, get up. What would happen in a funeral? Something like that would happen, man. I mean, everybody would freak out. I would shoot. That is a miracle. I'd like to see that. Well, this man saw a number of them. Not one, but saw a number of them. This, this man saw Jesus use his intellect in order to be able to defend himself from the attacks of the highly educated people. The ones that were coming to embarrass him. The ones that were coming to fool him, to put him into a corner so that he would say something that would be bad for him, that they could accuse him. Oh, you see, he said that, but Jesus used his mind and would be able to go around and, and give him answers that sometimes they would leave and, and when they got to wherever it is that they were going, they said, what did he say? I don't know. I don't know. Other times they understood and they just walked away with their heads down. He, he, he made me feel like I didn't know anything. He, they saw, these two men saw Jesus do that on a number of occasions. They heard Jesus answer deep theological questions, but real life questions too. <clears throat> because there are theological questions. There are. But those are... Frankly, most of the time, those are not the really critical questions in life. The real critical questions in life are, are life questions. Do I marry? Do I not marry? Do I have kids? Do I don't? Do I go to study this? Do I go to study that? Do I quit school? Do, that's real life stuff. That's not Daniel 11. And I'm not saying anything about Daniel 11. I'm not talking bad about that, but there are real life questions that need to be answered. And people came to Jesus with real life questions. And Jesus would tell them, here's the answer to your question. Now the problem is that many a times we know the answer to our questions. The problem is implementing the answer to our questions or accepting the answers that we know that question gets answered with that answer. Both of them were confronted by their weaknesses and their sinfulness. And they both came to realize who they truly were. Both men heard the news of salvation directly from the Savior. It wasn't from the pastor. It wasn't from Pastor Pedro, Pastor Orlando, Pastor this or Pastor that. It wasn't from them. It was from Jesus. Hear him, Jesus, giving you the message of salvation. He who is salvation himself now is coming to bring you the message of salvation. Man, that's special. And these two men saw that. As a matter of fact, these two men also received, talking about miracles, the power for them to do miracles. See, they got the power from Jesus to do miracles. Luke 9, verses 1 and 2. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. These two men received power. It wasn't just about preaching. It was about going places and healing people. These two men got that. And they went and they did it. They were sent to call men to repentance, to tell men, and when I say men, it's generically speaking, women too, you're sinners, but you have a chance to be saved. You need to repent of your sins. 
These two men were called to do that and they did it. Both of them were exposed to the same teaching and the, and the same experiences at the same time. It's not like someone went to school 10 years ago and somebody goes to school now. The experiences are totally different. No, these this two men were with Jesus at the same time. They were hearing the same. They were listening to the same. They were seeing the same. They, they were seeing everything around them. It was all the same. Everything was the same. And both of them experienced it at the same time. They both discovered that they were sinners too. And they felt humongous amount of pain as a result of realizing how much of a sinner they were. Both were instruments of Satan. You believe that? Men that Jesus has sent to do miracles, to preach for repentance, yet Satan used this man. They became instruments of Satan. Finally, they both betrayed Jesus publicly and radically so that there were no doubts where they stood. Their betrayal was so clear that no one who heard it or saw it had any doubt as to what it is that they were doing and saying. Two men, shoulder to shoulder, walking with their Savior. Two men. One. He is now respected and honored. And many people have his name. But you know, when the popes become popes, they weren't popes before, they were priests at a certain level, but when they become, when, when a priest becomes a pope, he takes a new name. Saint this, saint that, they take that name in order to, to name themselves, but there's never been a pope that has taken the name of this man because to take the name of this man would be a sign of disrespect to that man. That name is so high, that even the popes say, I can't, I can't take his name. I can take all the other names, but that name I can't take. It would be disrespectful for me to do it. This man, churches have been opened with their name. Parks have his name. Statues have, been, has his, have his name. This man, his life came to an end as a martyr for Jesus. What is his name? Anybody want to tell me his name? I guess you're in doubt. So what is his name? Peter. Yes, Peter. That is his name. That is his name. One. One of them is considered despicable. And nobody carries that name. See, you don't name your child that. As a matter of fact, you don't even name a dog that. You don't. And there are no popes that have ever taken that name. Now it's not about being disrespectful to him. It's about being disrespectful to themselves. Because it would be bochornoso, embarrassing for them to take his name to name themselves. There's not a single church, there's not a single park, there's not a single statue, nothing that carries that guy's name. His life ended by his own hand as a result of what he had done to Jesus. And what is his name? That's right, his name is Judas name is Judas. One, one of them we will see in heaven. And one of them will be able to, at some point in time, you know, I dream about these things and maybe that's not the way things work when we get there. But I, I, I dream about being able to go and talk to people and ask them, how was it to go through that situation? I mean, I'd, I'd love to, to at one point in time go and Talk to Adam and say, Oye, brother, come on. De verdad, man. I mean, I know, you know, I see her. She's really pretty. Wow. 
Pero, bro, wasn't there another way? Couldn't you have done something else? I don't know. Maybe when I get there, I won't say that. But, you know, if I see, if I see Peter, I'd like to sit down with Peter and say, Peter, t tell me about, tell me what was it to be able to stand in front of a multitude and tell them, point them with the finger and say, you did this. You did this to him and start preaching to them. And at the end, thousands of them say, what? You're right. What do we do? And you say, repent and baptize. That's what you need to do. How did, how did that feel to have all those people turning on a dime? Because those were the same people that just a few days before had been in, in front of Pontius Pilate saying, crucificale, crucifica. How, how was that, Peter? I don't know, man. Peter, I don't know if, if we'll, we'll want to remember the bad things. But man, Peter's crucifixion, because Peter was crucified too, but Peter's crucifixion. And, and to know that Peter himself said, you know, I'm not worthy to be crucified like he was. I want to, we'll, we'll do it upside down. I, I don't know how that, I don't know how that works. How, how do you have the, the wherewithal to be able to do that? One, the other. I hope we never get to see. Because if you get to see Judas, you are in deep trouble. It won't be about asking him anything. It's about the fact that you better get ready to be burned because you're, you're really dying forever with him. So I hope none of us will ever see him and, and have to ask him something. Two, both together with Jesus for three years, experiencing the same things, listening, seeing the same things, being taught the same things, yet they each ended on totally opposite sides of the spectrum. It could very well be the reason why when you see the list of all the apostles in the Bible, in each list, Peter is number one, And Judas is number 12. And I don't know that it was because Peter was more important than anybody else. I think it could be a way of, of Jesus himself telling us, see how far away these people were? Peter was on one side and Judas was on the other side. I can't put him in the middle. I can't put, no, no, because Judas was so far away. I, wa I want to show you how far away he was. So lives that were similar in a similar time with similar experiences, yet they ended up in very different places. And I guess all this begs the question, and the question would be why? Because if you're being taught the same things, it's like, like kids, you know, a little bit like kids. You have two kids and you raise them together and they're both your kids but they end up very different. And I'm not talking about bad, I'm just talking, in, they're so different. I can tell you, my two boys are so different. They, they're, they're about a year and a half apart. They were always in the same room and going to school. Uh, uh, they were like two grades in between, but then one of the boys was able, he's, he, he's, he, he likes to study. So he studied so much that one of the teachers came and, and talked to my wife and says, why don't you uh, give him or let us give him a test so he can skip a, a, a year? And he did. He took the test. He passed it. So he was now one year behind him. And somebody said, why don't you do that? And he said, no, 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 no. We, we don't need to push him so far. No, leave him. Let him be. Let him be. So, and that's why, but they, they were like one class away from each other in the, in the school all the time, at home, and they are so different that if anybody told me that they are not my sons, I would say, oh, it makes sense, because they're so different. But I tell my wife, if they're not, don't tell me now, because I already love them. I don't want to hear about it. But this man had the same experiences. Everything. And they were not little kids. They were grown men. How? Why? Well, I'm going to tell you why right now. The why, the reason why, 
is their relationship to Jesus. That's the crux of the matter. What was their relationship to Jesus? What was that? We know when we see them that salvation is not about works because they did all the work and they were ready to get lost. As a matter of fact, one of them was lost. And salvation is not about knowledge. Salvation is not about knowing uh, uh, the statue of Daniel 2 and, and uh, explaining Daniel 11. And if anybody can, please tell me because I'm dying to know. No. <laughs> uh, knowing all these things and the 2300 year prophecy and the 1260 year prophecy, explaining all these great things and, and uh, the, the message of the three angels. I mean, the theological stuff. And I'm not talking bad about that. I, I study that. I like like that I, I I like to know all this stuff but knowledge doesn't get you saved see when Jesus comes he doesn't give you a test tell me where is blank explain to me blank then that's not the test you know the only test is is how close to me are you that's the only test and that's the why to this man because this man were wanting to get more than what they were willing to give. Let me give you an example of that. John 12, verses 1 to 6. <clears throat> then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of nard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. But one of the disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box. And he used to take what was put in it. So here comes Mary and takes out this, this perfume that is more expensive. I don't know. There, 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 there could be. I, I, you know, I meant to research that and I, I ran out of time. Is there a perfume that costs more than what the average salary is today for a year? For a year. I don't know. I, I, I didn't research it. I'd be surprised to know that. I mean, because we were talking about Yule, so I would know. Uh, and cars, yeah, yeah. The answer is yes, cars, are, you know. And houses, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah. But a perfume? A perfume could cost more than the salary of a man was in a year? Because that's, that's the, the amount that Judas is saying that it was worth. What a man would earn in an entire year. And Judas is saying, we could have used that money for someplace, something else. And you would say, shoot, maybe so, man. Maybe we could have. Had. But then John, who's writing, says, listen, calm down. Don't be thinking. Don't be thinking about that. Because he wasn't saying that because he wanted to feed the homeless. Don't be saying that. He, he was saying that because he was the one that carried the money. He was the treasurer of the group. And he, the money would go there. And we found out he was stealing. That's the only reason he was saying, Oh, yeah, pero ese dinero hubiéramos podido echar aquí en mi bolsillo. He wanted to take more than he was willing to give. But before we judge him too harshly, before we do that, let me tell you that some of the other apostles were along the same line of Judas. Not because they were stealing, but because it was that mentality of I want to take what's in it for me. Cuanto me toca a mí? How am I going to benefit from this? How does it benefit me? It's that type of thinking where I'm the focus. It's not Jesus the focus. The focus is me. Look at this. Mark 10, 32 to 34. Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them. And they, and they were amazed. 
And as they followed, they were afraid. Then he took the 12 aside again and began to tell them the things that would happen to him. Behold, this is Jesus speaking to his 12 apostles. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem and the son of man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles and they will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him and on the third day he will rise again. Imagine that you are one of the 12 apostles. Imagine for yourself. Put yourself there. Now, they had just finished hearing a parable that Jesus had given to the disciples, a bigger group. But now Jesus takes the 12 aside and starts walking with them. And I don't know if he sat down under a tree or made a stop. I said, let me tell you something. Let me, tell, let me tell you, they were on their way to Jerusalem. This is very close to the end. We're on the uh, way to Jerusalem, and let me tell you what's going to happen when we get there. Now, he had been talking about these things, but kind of, you, you would have to, like, kind of read between the lines. He wasn't saying it flat out, uh, in your face type of thing, but here is in your face. What, what did Jesus say? They are, we're going to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man, me, I will be betrayed to the chief priest. Now, he's not saying the chief priests are going to betray me. I am going to be betrayed to the chief priest and delivered me to the Gentiles and they will mock me and they will scourge me and they will spit on me and they will kill me. But on the third day, I will rise. If you are one of the 12 apostles, what comes to your mind? What are you thinking about? Who, who, is going, who is going to betray you? You may think. You may say, who, who is going to betray you? Or you may say, so why are we going to Jerusalem? Let's not go. Is there something that we can do to prevent that? Jesus, tell me, who do we need to go see so this doesn't happen? What is it that we need to do so something like this? You're saying they're going to take you, they're going to mock you, they're going to spit on you, they're going to beat you up, and then they're going to kill you, and I'm going to sit here? No, that can't happen. I mean, I want to think that if you and I were sitting there with the 12, we would be saying that. Am I crazy in thinking that? I don't think so. I don't think so. I want to, I want to think that. That that's what we would say. But, but you know what? There were a couple of them that weren't thinking along those lines. Let me tell you what they were thinking. Mark 10, 35 and 37, the next two verses. Three verses. Oh, yeah, two verses. Mark 10, 35 to 37. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Period. Let me stop there. So Jesus has just finished saying what's going to happen to him. And these two men pulled Jesus aside. Master, come over here. Let me talk to you. Now, if it was me and, and I had finished saying that, I would have thought that they were pulling me aside to say, oh, yeah, we got we to gotta figure out a way to fix this because that can't happen. Well, that can't happen to you. You're too important. You're the Messiah. We can't let them do that to you. We love you. We can't. They pull him to the side. We want you to do whatever we ask. And he said to them, man, Jesus was so patient. He was so patient. I mean, if it had been me, I would have kicked them. I just told you they're going to kill me, bro. And now you're pulling me aside to say, you want me to do something for you? How about you doing something for me? How about that? It's not you that's going to be taken and spit and hit and killed. It's not you, it's me. And now you're pulling me to ask me something? Man, Jesus. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, grant us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left in your glory. What is in it for me? 
They're going to take me. They're going to betray me. They're going to hit me. They're going to spit me. They're going to insult me. They're going to kill me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I get it. Pero, pero, you know. Pero, what's in it for me? Pero, y a mí. Porque mira, yo lo que quiero es que yo quiero estar a la derecha y el otro a la izquierda. You know, and if they really knew what they were saying, because there were going to be two people, one on his left and one on his right, and you really didn't want to be that, those two guys. You really didn't want to be them. Sounds pretty tough to know that the apostles who were hearing Jesus say all that were now thinking about themselves. Now let's talk about Peter for a moment. Because Peter has his story too. And you know Peter's story. You know Peter's story. Matthew 26, verses 31 to 33. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me, of, of me this night. For it is written, This is the night he was going to be betrayed. The night he was going to be arrested. <coughs> All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. So Jesus is telling all his disciples, said, listen, there's something really bad is going to happen tonight. It's tonight. It's not two weeks from now. It's not two years from now. It's tonight. And all of you are going to stumble. And that's a really diplomatic way of saying it, man. That is a really nice way of saying it. You will be made to stumble. And Peter is sitting or standing. I don't know whether they were sitting or standing. And Peter, rather than saying, Jesus, no, do something so that, no, you help us or let us help you. No, Peter says, mira, yo no sé esta partida de imbéciles, pero yo sí no voy. I don't know about these idiots here, but I will never, I will never do that to you. Never. I don't care what happens. I will never do that to you. Man, that must have been, there could have been a smile in Jesus' face. I could see him smiling. Like when somebody tells you something really stupid. But they really, like, really? Like you go, really? <laughs> really? Really? Are you serious? Yeah, really? Really? See, because Jesus was saying this because he already knew the end of the beginning. You know, he knew the end of the movie. So he knew who had killed the guy. Uh, he, he knew everything. So Matthew 26, 34 to 35, Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you, you, he didn't say them. He didn't say all of you. He said you, because he was the one that's saying, them bien, pero yo no, not me. He says, you, you, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, oh no, Lord, help me so I don't deny you. Is that what he said? Even if, if I have to die for you, I will not deny you. And then all the disciples that were listening to him said, oh yeah, me too, me too. Oh no, yo también, yo, me too. Yo, yo, lo, lo que dice él. We know what happened that night. You know that Jesus was taken. And he was taken and beat up, spit upon, and insulted. And John knew where they had taken Jesus. That's part of the story. I can't take the time for that. But he went and got Peter. He says, Peter, I have a way of getting into the house where they're having Jesus. Let's go see what's happening. And they went. And when they're standing there in, in a line of sight with Jesus where they can, they can see what's happening to Jesus, some of the other people that were around John and Peter tell Peter, Chico, a mí me parece que yo te he visto con este hombre. I think I've, uh, haven't I seen you with him? Aren't you one of his followers? What did Peter say? Not me. Not me. No, not me. 
And then somebody else said, Pero, yeah, man, I, I saw you the other day. You know, you were walking here and there. And Peter said, no, chico, it's not me. Would you nuts? What's wrong with you? And then somebody else said, I could have sworn I saw you. I even heard you. And now Peter, who really wanted to make sure that they knew it wasn't him, and it was, of course, he says, you be blah, 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 it's not me. And they say, oh, yeah, no, no, no. Anybody that can say that, yeah, it's not a disciple of Jesus. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't you, I guess. And if Peter is finishing saying this, what did he hear? Man, the rooster starts crowing. And something went inside his heart like a knife. Because he had been told. And he remembered. It had happened minutes ago. And then he said, there's the rooster. He told me that we would betray him. And we all have. And we would stumble. And I told them no. And then as, as Peter is looking around, he sees Jesus. And Jesus is looking back at him. And it's one of those moments when you say, Tierra, trágame. What have I done? What have I done? A few days passed. But the pain in Peter's heart had not gone away. As a matter of fact, he had seen Jesus already. Resurrected Jesus. But the pain in your heart of that treason doesn't go away. See, the fact that Jesus resurrected like he did and like he said he would do doesn't do anything to solve my treason. To solve the fact that I betrayed him when I told them I would never do that. I have been willing to give my life. And when they come and get him, I got out my sword. Why he had a sword? That's another conversation. I got my sword and I tried to rip his head off. I couldn't, but that's what I was aiming to do. And if they killed me, they killed me. And Jesus said, no, 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 don't do that. I don't need you to do that. But now, when I saw that the person that I thought was the Messiah, the one that was going to liberate us, the one that was going to kick the Romans in the you-know-what, the one that was going to make us as important as we always thought we were, he is being taken, and he is being ignored, and he is being insulted, and he is being hit, and he is being done as a, okay, that can't be. As a matter of fact, I, you know what, I, it was a mistake. No, I don't want to be his disciple. I don't want to be him. A few days passed, and Jesus saw him again. John 21, 15 to 17. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? I, I bet he was just talking to Peter. Because I don't know that he would tell that in a group. He wouldn't. I don't see him saying in front of everybody else, do you love me more than these? I, I bet that it was just a, a you and me kind of conversation. Because you know what? When it was you and me, that you betrayed me. I want to have a you and me moment now. Do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again for a second time, Simon, Son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said it to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Three times he betrayed him. Three times Jesus gave him a chance to say, I really do love you. You know I love you. You know how much I've suffered for what I've did to you. And Jesus had to pick him up and restore him. Because that's what Jesus is about. Jesus is not about putting his foot on you because you're a sinner. 
Jesus is about taking your hand and raising you up. Because that's what he came to do. Now that doesn't mean that you are not a sinner and that you can continue in your sin. It doesn't mean that. What it means is that Jesus is willing to pick you up and say, you are my son, you are my daughter, you are special to me. I want you to have a relationship with me. Parallel lives ended in different roads, both ashamed of what they had done. One takes his life for what he had done to Jesus. The other one gives his life for Jesus. Two. Two. I don't know how many of us we are here today. Plenty more than two. But it could be that today there's only two here. It could be that here this afternoon we have two people. Two who come the Sabbath. Two who come to the service. Two who come to Sabbath schools. Two who take the same lessons. Two who have studied the same things. Two who have read the same Bibles. Two who have listened to everything. Same roads. Yet, I wonder if we have this afternoon just two persons here. Peter and Judas. And I don't know if there's a third option. Because each one of us has gone through life and on occasion, we have betrayed Jesus. On occasion, we have been embarrassed to not do something because we don't want people to laugh at us or not to act a certain way or, or join the crowd because they're going to make fun of me, they're going to bully me. So, so somehow or another, see, the reasons may be different, but the end result is the same. We still betrayed him. Two, two persons, parallel walks, but we could end up in much different places. And it all comes down to the relationship with Jesus. If you develop a relationship with him where you are willing to give more of yourself, then you can have a relationship with him. But when all you do is ask and ask and ask and ask and ask and not willing to give, you may be looking for your back to be filled so that you can feed yourself and feed your desires, but you're not thinking about your salvation. You're thinking of the today, and Jesus is not thinking of the today. Jesus is thinking of the tomorrow because the today is so fleeting. It was only yesterday that I was feeding my babies. It was only yesterday that I was running from law school and telling my wife, at what time do you feed him? I didn't have a cell phone. It was 40 years ago. I would say, I want to feed him. It was my first boy, Peter. It was my first boy. I said, I want to feed him. I said, I can't hold him. He, he eats when he's hungry and he lets me know. He said, well, do something. Uh, and I would run from Fort Lauderdale 45 minutes back then to get home and sit there in a rocking chair with a little bottle and me feeding my baby. And I have a picture of that. And I remember that I was 40 years ago because today is fleeting but tomorrow is eternal. And we need to make decisions that will impact our eternal life more than they will impact our today life. That Peter who betrayed Jesus wrote something for you. He wrote something for you. First Peter 1, verse 8 and 9. In this you greatly rejoice, 
though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being that much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom you have not seen, but you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. See, Peter had seen Jesus, but Peter knew that we were going to be here 2,000 years later. And Peter is sending us a message. And that message is, listen guys, you haven't seen him. I know you haven't seen him. I saw him, but you haven't. Why did I get that privilege? I don't know. But you haven't seen him. But I want you to love him even you, though you haven't seen him. Because he loves you more than you will ever love him. But I want you to understand that he exists, that he is alive, and that he is coming for you because he wants to save each and every one of you. And Jesus came back and saved Peter. And he would have done the same thing for Judas. He would have gone to Judas had Judas given him a chance. He would have gone to see him and he would have extended an arm to him and say, Judas, I love you. But Judas didn't give him a chance because the pain in his heart was too much. And I want to let you know that the pain in your heart cannot be too much. Raise up your arm and touch Jesus because he is trying to touch you. So I'm hoping that if there are two persons here today, both of them are Peter and no Judas's. Because if we are, we will be able to do great things in his name. Because we have cho been chosen for great things. We have not been chosen to seat in a pew in a church in Westchester. That is not why we were called. He called us for something. And if you develop a relationship with him, he will be able to teach you his love and his desire for your life. As we listen to our worship team, think about whether you have developed a good relationship with Jesus. If you haven't, you still got time. Don't be Judas about it. You still got time. Reach out to him. And if you develop a good relationship with him, then develop one that is even better. Because if you're Peter, you can love him and he can love you back and great things will be in your future. And he will do great things for you and through you.
So, Peters of Westchester, I hope you're ready to develop a new relationship with Jesus. I hope you're ready to see a new day because Jesus came here today to look for you. He died and was resurrected to give you a chance for a new life. And he wants you to do something really special for him. You. And I'd be saying that whether there were 300 people here or whether there was only one person here. He wants to do something special in you and through you. But if you don't develop a closer relationship with him, you will never find out because you will never hear his words. You will never get his teachings. You will never feel his love. If you get closer to him, you will feel it. And you will be proud to be called Peter. Because Peter did great things for Jesus. And maybe when I see him, I won't remember all the not so great things. But I'll remember certainly the great things he did. Because the Lord used him. And he will be in heaven. Seated right next to him. May we stand for a final word of prayer. Padre eterno, te agradezco, Señor, la oportunidad de haberme dirigido a estos muchachos, trayendo tu palabra. La que, la que tú quisiste enviarle, esa es la que ha sido traída hoy, porque tú has dirigido todo para que ellos escucharan esto. Que aquí pueden haber Judas o Pedros, pero ahora queremos saber que solo hay Pedros, que los Judas han quedado atrás que los que traicionaron a Jesús han quedado atrás que los que le negaron has quedado atrás y que los que están aquí te aman aunque no te han visto y están esperando tener una relación más cercana a ti bendícenos a todos pon tu mano sobre nosotros perdona Señor nuestros pecados y capacítanos para el trabajo que tú tienes designado para cada uno que podamos hacerlo y de esa forma, Señor, sentirte, que puedas sentirte orgulloso de que tienes un hijo y una hija aquí en la Iglesia Adventista de Westchester. Que son salvos no porque son miembros de iglesia, que son salvos porque han desarrollado una relación con su Salvador. Bendícenos, Padre, ahora al regresar a nuestros hogares y que tu presencia siempre esté con nosotros. Perdónanos, Padre, en el nombre de Cristo oramos. Amen. Maranatha, Jesus is coming soon. May the Lord bless you. Thank you, Dr. Ridarte, for a wonderful message. Have a blessed rest of the day and blessed of the week. <laughs> and let's be Peters this week. Thank you. Bye.